That's Charlie, my pet lizard, in all his glory. Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. September 12th, 2024. Let's get into it. So I always try to give you a little self-help up front in the video here. And uh, it's something that I'm seriously considering because money is tight. And I'm sure money's probably tight for you. And I wanted to talk about self-insurance. All right, now you can't do this if you got a mortgage. So you, but uh, if, you, if you have your house paid off like I do, uh, one of the things I'm seriously considering, especially if they keep going, if they go up again, I am gonna do it. Where I'm gonna just self-insure my house. Okay, now you say, well, that's crazy, man. What happens if you have a fire or something catastrophic? Well, yeah. It's a big risk, but you know, look back on my parents. They paid homeowner's insurance for 85 years. Well, I guess shouldn't say that. All right, let's say 65 years, because I don't think they've had a house until they were 20 years old. All right, 65 years. All right, they paid on that, that insurance policy. They made one claim in 65 years, and that was only for about $10,000. Oh, check him out, man. We got a turtle. Let's get him on the video. I hate scaring them like that, <laughs> but, but they are cool. He's back out. He's, see, I only scared him for a minute. Anyway, uh, so I, in my life, you know, I'm 60 years old, I'll tell you that. Well, I'll be 61 here soon. I've never made a claim. Not once. Renter's insurance, of course I was a renter for many years. Homeowner's insurance, I have never made a claim. Uh, you know, here in Florida we have the danger of sinkholes. But you know what, the way they write them policies now, I'm not even sure my house would be covered if it fell in a sinkhole. <laughs> I mean, there's probably a clause down in that policy somewhere that says it's not gonna get covered. Same thing goes for like a car. You know, it used to be that if you took the collision off of your uh, policy and just carried liability, that was a big savings. But I've noticed now that, at least with my policy, uh, I don't get a huge savings just by doing liability. So you pretty much have to have that liability because, man, you, you hit a pedestrian or something, you know, they're, they're going to take everything you got. So, you, I mean, I understand. So it's, it's hard not to, to, to self-insure a car. Uh, plus, you know, it's, it's illegal in some states, which I think is, is stupid. But I will tell you this. I do self-insure my motorcycle. The reason being, I, I hardly ever ride it. I ride it about once a month. Well, the, and during the rainy season here, I don't take it out at all. There's nothing worse than being on a motorcycle in a pouring down thunderstorm. I mean, especially with mine, I don't have that cover. And man, I tell you, that rain beating on you at 60 miles an hour, it's like bullets hitting you. It's brutal. But, uh, but yeah, so since I, you know, and they'd say, well, you can put it in, you know, take it in and out of storage. What a pain in the butt. So I just wanted to talk about insurance for just a second. Ah, uh, this is a great video. I was seeing a lot of people on X talking about Biden putting on a Trump hat. <laughs> I thought, oh man, that, there's no way that didn't happen. I found the video. Watch this video. Trump hat, I'll give you my presidential hat. Presidential seal on it. You want to autograph it? Oh, sure, I'll autograph it. Huh? Yeah. You remember your name? I don't remember my name. I'm slow. Sure, of course. You're an old part. Yeah, I know, man. I'm an old guy. <laughs> and you're an old person. Uh, I know you would know about that. What? I'm being old. Oh, I know. All right. I'm a young timer. Huh? <laughs> he reminds me of the guys I grew up with. There was always one in the neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm the only one. There you go, man. I, got, I, need, I need that hat. You want my autograph? Hell no. <laughs> you know my name. Come on. Come on. I ain't going that far. Yeah. You said you would do a selfie. There you go. Yeah. 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 Hey. I'm proud of you now. You're 
Just remember, no eating dogs and cats. Uh, <laughs> hey, they're good. Thank you. Is that crazy or what? I, I, I hate to say it, he's a corrupt, you know, person that's destroyed the United States, but I kind of liked him in that video, didn't you? <laughs> All right, uh, I wanted to get to uh, Tulsi Gabbard for just a second. She was on uh, Greg Gutfield, and she was talking about the, uh, uh, I think she was talking about the debate. Let's watch that video now. Were you surprised how the moderators heavily weighted the debate? Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Uh, I, I think we it was uh, what we should all have expected. Mm -hmm. uh, we see how these people operate. You know, you look at the comments that Muir has made. You look at the comments that Lindsey Davis has made. Their bias was baked in from the very beginning because they're not real journalists. Yeah. They are essentially these political operatives whose job it is to try to distract away from Kamala Harris's record, distract away from the serious issues that we face. Not a single question was raised about uh, how are you going to prevent the destruction of our country and the world from nuclear war, which we are closer to than ever before? Mm -hmm. And on the eve of the Islamist terrorist attack on 9-11, they did not raise a point, a question, or a challenge mm -hmm. about how either of these candidates will stem the spread of this radical Islamist ideology around the world and in our own country here at home and how you would prevent this threat from continuing to grow. So. You know, they were not at all interested in, in informing the American people about the truth about anything. Uh, we can expect that they will continue to be propagandists for Kamala Harris. All right, so that was Tulsi Gabbard. And uh, I wanted to get into the uh, illegal aliens just briefly. Uh, the Ohio governor, um, he has uh, dispatched help to uh, Springfield to deal with the Haitians. Uh, and I saw... I've seen people at a city council meeting, they were talking about the Haitians eating ducks and geese. That's what the Democrats are all about. They want 30 million illegal aliens in the United States because they want to change the outcome of the election. That's who Democrats are. They cheat, cheat, cheat. All right. So anyway, let's keep going. Uh, but I did want. Oh, yeah. And the NGOs. Redacted just did a video on these non-governmental organizations and how Garland, that traitor up in the up in the Biden administration, is funding them to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars to bring all these illegal aliens into the country, you know, put them up in housing, give them uh, credit cards, cell phones, everything else. So, I mean, they're saying it's upwards in the billions of dollars now that we have spent bringing, you know, with these NGOs. And there was, you know, there's about three or four of them. Can you imagine? And the people that are running these operations are making millions of taxpayer dollars. I mean, it's insane. And then when you look at Ukraine and how we've whitewashed money, I mean, you understand these are huge, huge grifting operations. I mean, there is so much corruption. I don't see how the United States survives. I mean, the dollar, when BRICS meets in October, the dollar is history. That is if we make it to October. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not sure if we're going to get into, uh, well, the next story was uh, the attackums. So I guess that uh, we're going to prove long-range missile strikes into Russia. Now, does this mean Russia is going to launch nuclear weapons? Pro probably not. At this point, they're more focused on the BRICS.
conference coming up because they know they're going to bury the United States once the dollar's gone. I mean, how are you going to pay? If you can't pay your military personnel, those 800 military bases around the world are just going to go away. NATO is going to go away because we're not funding it. So I, you know, I, I know the Russians are going to be patient, but look, I want to point this out to you. All it takes is one mistake. Right now, there's uh, U.S. forces building up all around in the, in the uh, NATO countries around Russia. And we've been moving uh, uh, missiles into those countries. Well, Russia, I mean, all they got to do is interpret one of those launches as a possible nuclear strike. And they're going to strike back. And then that's the end of the world. Think of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Or there's been, you know, it's been three instances where we almost went to nuclear war over a mistake. One of the stories I heard was a bunch, a flock of geese were coming in. I guess it's in the Reagan movie. And uh, they were telling him, launch, launch, launch. And then finally they realized that it was a flock of geese and not a bunch of ICBMs from the Soviet Union. So there's been a huge number of instances. So we are a hair trigger away from the end of the world. And we need to get the warmongering Democrats out before they destroy us all, man. Uh, the, uh, with getting, you know, get talking about that, let's get to uh, Kursk. Uh, you know, I felt that that attack into Kursk was a mistake, and a lot of people felt the same way. You know, of course, the propaganda that everybody gets from the mainstream media is the success of the, of the Ukrainians in taking Russian territory and all of that. <clears throat> but then today I was watching... Of all places, the Duran. And uh, they were interviewing, uh, well, I can't remember his name. I should have put it in my notes. But anyway, this is the greatest synopsis ever of why Kirsch was a trap. I hate borrowing too much of their material. It's, it's so, but I wanted to get this clip into the video. This is it. And I'd like to turn to the Kursk operation because, as I'm sure you know, I, I, I was contacted about two and a half months ago by somebody who told me, uh, and somebody I should, I, the one thing I'll say about this person is he has a military background. And he told me that uh, the Russians were setting a trap. Now, I found that there is a sharp division of opinion about this ever since I first mentioned the fact that this is what this person had told me, which is that without exception, every single civilian commentator has completely dismissed that idea. They said this is impossible. This is <laughs> what happens. Putin was obviously caught by surprise. Whereas I noticed that military people, and remember, I'm not one, um, have said this is actually, it makes sense. It might indeed have been what the Russians were doing. And well, we've now seen what has happened in Kursk. I, I, I have received those emails. I've seen what they say. Um, they look convincing to me. I'm not able to judge them and I'm not able to second guess this person's sources. But where are we in Kursk? Today we're hearing about an offensive that the Russians are carrying out there. Um, every day we see pictures of Ukrainian losses. Was this another misguided, misconceived offensive that the Ukrainians launched? And why, oh why, given that it seems to be falling apart, at least that's my own sense, mm -hmm. why, oh why do we continue to support the Ukrainians in these foolish things? That's, uh, well, start with uh, the trap, Alex. Um, you know, I, I am firmly of the opinion that it was a trap. Uh, you look at, if you look at the way the Russians fight war, if you look at the indicators on the ground, starting with the fact that they removed uh, the minefields in front of those positions with really no one behind it, um, you know, to, to check a Ukrainian advance, and you couple that with the demographics of the Kursk region, there's very little room, I believe, for, you know, any other conclusion than that period. Um, you know, it's, uh, it starts with, you know, my, my, my conception of this starts with the fact that the Russians have dominance in the electro electronic warfare space. Um, and the closer you get to their border, the more impactful that becomes, the more information they can pick up. This isn't just jamming, it's getting inside of communications equipment. Um, we've been seeing the effectiveness of that for, for a couple of years now where there's all kinds of stories and reports out there of Ukrainians turning on a cell phone or getting on a radio and then immediately taking artillery fire. Um, so they dominate that space. And 
they, I would assume that they understood Ukrainians were looking for a way to try and take pressure off of the troops who were being squeezed in the Donbass. And they found an area which they thought they might want to invade. It was probably very lightly defended. Um, there was reports, I believe, uh, prior to the Ukrainian invasion that the Russians were going to use that avenue as, a, as an invasion route into Ukraine. Um, they demined it. And then the best units in the Ukrainian military at the, at, that are remaining appear to have crossed the border. Um, so tactically and operationally, if you're facing a stubborn defender, um, in any type of tactical construct, the thing that you want to do primarily as, you know, as the attacker is to get the defender out of his defenses and in the open. Um, that was the most deadly period of World War One, by the way, when everybody was in the open. Um, so they effectively did that and they canalized them. If you look at the maps, there aren't very many roads in Kursk. There's, I believe, one road that would qualify as a main supply route um, going into that in, at the area that was invaded. There aren't many people in that oblast. There's a million people, period. There's several thousand miles of uh, rivers, which are a nightmare if you are an attacking army. Um, you constantly have to ford them. You look, bridges can get blown behind you. You get trapped. Um, the lack of roads makes resupply very challenging. Uh, and then you have the terrain, which is hilly. Uh, and it's a mix of open fields, which is perfect for a defender in this kind of war. Um, and then fairly obvious, I, I like to quote Monty Python here, you know, the importance of not being seen. It's one of my favorite skits of all time. Um, very obvious tree lines uh, where, you know, the attacking forces are going to try to hide. So you have all these pieces, right? Um, it's hard to move. It's obvious. It was easy. And it sucked in their best units. Um, then you have the next part of this, right, which is the, the misunderstanding in the West of the Russian way of war. Um, you know, we in the West, we have a, a very much capture the flag kind of uh, doctrine on the battlefield. And it was uh, kind of a, a great example of that was the capture of Baghdad in uh, 2003, where you have the objective, you make a beeline for the objective, um, and you penetrate through the defenses. And as you penetrate through the defenses with armored units or mechanized units, Infantry catches up and takes care of the enemy soldiers who are now fixed in their positions and cut off. Um, so what you saw kind of on the map are these small groups of Ukrainian forces penetrating as deep as they could. They seized key pieces of terrain. And, you know, what, uh, what really sold me, the final piece that sold me on this being a trap was the lack of a massive Russian response uh, immediately. You would expect that uh, a country being invaded would immediately throw a large amount of troops to check that advance. They have, in effect, let them in and then started picking off their equipment uh, piece by piece, leaving the infantry behind to, to, to fend for themselves. And if, you know, you are an infantryman on the ground, there's almost only so much weight you can carry. It's really right around 100 pounds, and it has been for a thousand years. Um, and in today's world, that is a couple of days of ammunition, water, and food. And after that point, you are in, uh, you're in a really bad spot. And following the arc, you know, of the invasion of Kursk, the, the Ukrainian advances, obviously, they petered out. They ran out of equipment. They started to run out of ammunition. They started to take stiffer and stiffer resistance. And then, in effect, their positions were fixed, became obvious, and then came under a tremendous amount of indirect fire, uh, airstrikes, missile strikes, artillery. And now you're seeing, you know, the, the result. Um, why we keep supporting this is a great question. Um, however, you know, on the battlefield, once, once someone is engaged, you know, particularly in a conventional fight like this, it is very difficult to, to disengage and just leave. Uh, particularly when, in my opinion, you know, the Russians have seen a, a very great opportunity to wrap this thing up. Um, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's the, the total remainder of American equipment, but it's the preponderance. Um, it is it is, you know, they're handed a golden opportunity to take all this stuff out to eliminate what remains of a NATO cadre on the ground. And then once those guys are gone, who is behind them to to stop a Russian counterattack? Um, and historically, 
this area is a spot that the Russian army is incredibly familiar with. Um, the, the first battle of Kursk now, which used to be the battle of Kursk, you know, happened roughly in the same area. Um, and it was actually strikingly similar, uh, in, in many ways, not, not always, but in many ways to what's going on where the, the Germans attacked into a defense in depth. They eventually, you know, ran out of equipment and fuel um, to, to conduct their, their offensive. And this was the cream of what remained of the German army in 1943, um, particularly the cream of their equipment, the new Tiger tank, Panther tanks, um, some of their best armored units. And once they were checked and stopped, they were counterattacked from Kursk down through Sumy. Um, which we may very well see coming up. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, I, this is this is this is a, a complicated, a very complicated uh, situation where I would have liked to have seen, you know, some uh, some guidance from from the executive branch in the United States, whether it's Department of State or DOD, to say, hey, don't do this, and once they engage, to say, break this off and come back. But like I said previously, you know, once troops are in contact, you know, it's it's very difficult to do that. All right, so that was the Durand on how Kirsch was a trap for the Ukrainians. And right now, what's going on is that uh, they're getting slaughtered. The Russians moved in 60,000 troops. Now, you got to remember, Ukraine went across, well, they, you know, the estimates originally were like 11,000. Then I heard they were reinforced with another 20 or another 10,000. So it was up to 21,000. Of that, you know, all of their hardware has been destroyed. Uh, so now the, the men are on, on, you know, just uh, fighting. Well, like you heard in the Duran video. So anyway, that's uh, that's 21,000 dead Ukrainians in the next couple weeks. Can you imagine those kind of? I mean, good Lord, in Vietnam, how many did we lose? Over 50,000 in years of fighting, and the Ukrainians just lost 21,000 in what a couple of months. Was it worth it? I don't think so. Anyway, so Kirsch was a trap. Buddy of mine, he's going on. He says, Kirk, do you really believe 9-11 was a conspiracy? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, well, I guess you think we didn't land on the moon. I said, well, there's, a, there's been some documentaries about the fact that whether or not we landed on the moon. So I was trying to look out to find some of those videos about how they felt the moon landing was a hoax. And uh, actually, I found just the opposite. A lot of people are disputing the fact that it wasn't a hoax, and uh, you know, of course, you got to cite the 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 number of people that were working at NASA at that time. I mean, how could you, if all those people, you know, th knew it was a hoax, how could you get them all to shut up? Number one, number two, a lot of people point to the flag that was planted on the moon, that it was it was furled like it was blowing in the wind, and they said no, that was just because they put a rod in that flag, because otherwise. The flag would just droop down <laughs> because of gravity on the moon. So that's why it looked like that flag was blowing in the wind. And then a lot of people said, well, in the video, there's no stars. And then uh, there was a camera guy. He was talking about the fact that the, the, the glare coming off of the, the surface, the white surface of the moon, plus the video technology back then. And that's why the stars weren't visible in the video. So I'm, I'm more inclined now <clears throat> than I was after doing my research that I do believe we did land on the moon. So there you go. Oh my God, I proved my own conspiracy theory wrong. But 9-11, 9-11 was a conspiracy. Let's watch that video now. September 11th, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers in the military combat train pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. 
the administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination. Because... Nobody our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on able danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of the incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, NSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. Alright, so that was the video. We're going to get into a 9-11 reading here soon. Hope you've enjoyed the video today. See you soon. Before I get into the reading portion of the video, uh, there was a video that just came out of Putin making a statement on the attackums uh, coming into uh, Russia. Let's watch that video now. Последние дни мы видим и слышим, как на очень высоком уровне Великобритании и США муссируется тема о том, что киевский режим сможет наносить удар в территории России западными вооружениями большой дальности. И, судя по всему, это решение либо вот-вот будет принято, либо, судя по всему, вообще уже принято. И эта вещь, конечно, экстраординарная. Хотелось бы просить прокомментировать то, что происходит. Происходит попытка подмены понятий. Потому что речь не идет о разрешении или запрете на киевскому режиму наносить удары по российской территории. Он и так наносит с помощью беспилотных летательных аппаратов и другими средствами. Но когда речь идет о использовании высокоточного оружия большой дальности западного производства, это совершенно другая история. 
Дело в том, что я уже об этом говорил, и любые эксперты это подтвердят, и у нас, и на Западе. Наносить удары современными высокоточными системами большой дальности западного производства украинская армия не в состоянии. Она не может этого делать. Это возможно только с использованием разведданных с, со спутников, которыми Украина не располагает. Это данные только со спутников Евросоюза, либо на Соединенных Штатах. В общем, с натовских спутников. Это первое. Второе. И очень важно, может быть, ключевое, заключается в том, что полетные задания в эти ракетные системы могут, по сути, вносить только военнослужащие стран НАТО. Украинские военнослужащие делать это не могут. И поэтому речь идет не о том, чтобы разрешать украинскому режиму наносить удары по России этим оружием или не разрешать. Речь идет о том, чтобы принять решение о том, что страны НАТО э, напрямую участвуют в военном конфликте или нет. Если это решение будет принято, это будет означать не что иное, как э, прямое участие э, стран НАТО, Соединенных Штатов, европейских стран э, в войне на Украине. Это их прямое участие. И это уже, конечно, существенным образом меняет саму суть, саму природу конфликта. Это будет означать, что страны НАТО, США, европейские страны воюют с Россией. А если это так, то, имея в виду изменение самой сути этого конфликта, мы будем принимать соответствующие решения, исходя из тех угроз, которые нам будут создаваться. There's a couple of things, because uh, I want you to be proactive, not reactive. Uh, Colonel McGregor on Our Country, Our Choice, they just came out with the uh, social media website. Uh, the link is on my X uh, post. I'll also put it in the description below, but it's republic.us. Republic.us. And right now they're offering a um, early bird registration because uh, the, the fee is actually $180, but they've reduced it to $120. So that's $10 a month. It's going to be a, um, or it is, a social media platform. Uh, and it's more geared towards like a town hall type of environment. So if you want to know who your city councilman is, who, who your representatives are, all of that stuff, that's going to be on, because they're going to do that for all the local communities. And what they were pointing out was that they want you to get involved uh, in, in, in every way that you can. So right now, hundreds, over 100,000 kids have gone missing, and they believe that uh, they're in these uh, warehouses for pedophiles to uh, abuse. Um, many of them are, are actually dying after being raped a number of times. And uh, if you find one of these in your local community, because it could be a converted Walmart or something like that, uh, be sure and uh, bring that up to your local authorities, especially if you have a sheriff. Tell the sheriff uh, where that facility is. Maybe you can get uh, get your local officials to deal with the problem. So that was the uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about. Is so so definitely look around your communities and see if you can identify any place where you see these missing children that could be getting abused by uh, pedophiles, because there's so many of them now. Uh, the Democrats are huge into uh, human trafficking, child trafficking. That's the uh, the evil of the Democrat Party. Um, so look, keep an eye out for these kids that are being raped by these pedophiles. So the next thing I wanted to uh, to hit on was the NGOs. Uh, right now, they're going to be working the polls uh, in a lot of places. So I encourage you to at least, uh, you know, even if you voted ahead of time, go to the polls and see if uh, any of these... Um, uh, NGOs are, are there at the uh, voting polls so that you can uh, identify that to your local officials. Document it with your cell phone at least then. And then, of course, at republic.us, they're going to be putting together a database of all the reported incidents or the, anything reported fishy about the uh, coming election so that hopefully uh, we'll have all that documented uh, at, at republic.us. 
Um, and then the, 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 this gets to back to my conspiracy theory. <laughs> Another one is uh, they said that uh, they're heavily uh, uh, going to be uh, doing the polls in Texas. Now I've told you, Greg Abbott is a is a Democrat, and uh, he's uh, actually I'm not going to say he's supporting it, but he's not putting a stop to it. So these NGOs are going to be all over the Texas polls. Now, could this be the Democrat plan? Okay, maybe we are going to have a somewhat uh, fair election in most states. But if they can turn Texas blue, which, I mean, you'd say, oh, that's impossible. Not if they've got these, um, these illegal poll workers working all the polls in Texas. So you turn Texas blue, that's it. The election's over. Just saying. So now let's get into the reading portion of the video here. Uh, Ohio governor is now sending state troopers and millions in funding to Springfield, Ohio, to deal with the illegal alien uh, crisis. The media covered cover-up just imploded on itself. That was DC Dranko. Sorry, I got some mosquitoes buzzing me here. So we're going to get into uh, the 9-11 um, the video here in just a minute. As here we go. All right, so uh, this is Dr. Simon Goddard. Uh, 23 years ago, I literally woke up as a European living in Oklahoma. I witnessed the terror attacks of September 11th in a classroom amidst an immense hysteria and many inconsistencies that didn't add up. And so I thought this was a great post by him. Shortly before the terror attacks, Larry Silverstein purchased and insured the Twin Towers specifically against terror attacks. Coincidentally, he and his entire family were not at the World Trade Center that morning. After 9-11, Silverstein took the insurance company to court claiming he should be paid double because there were two attacks and one and he was awarded 4.55 billion dollars. Uh, the Pentagon is the most surveilled building in the world yet there is only one short video clip that allegedly shows a plane crashing into it. The question arises why did the FBI immediately confiscate uh, <clears throat> on it, another mosquito uh, why did the FBI immediately confiscate all videos from surrounding hotels and gas stations and to this day has not released a single video of the plane while the planes crashing into the World Trade Center were shown from every camera angle? How were there so many people able to call their families from the planes in 2001? In, tw in 2024, I can't even get a signal <laughs> until shortly before landing of the plane. Why did these people introduce themselves with their full names to their families? When I call my parents, I don't say, hey, this is Simon Goddick. Goddick. Ah, good question. Why were huge amounts of uh, nanothermite found in the World Trade Center ashes? I told you, controlled demolition. By the way, I want you to go over to Redacted. They're doing a whole series on all of this uh, this week. Um, but definitely watch them on Rumble. I, if you, you watch them on YouTube, sometimes they can't talk about certain things. Uh, many people, I don't know that a third high, many people don't know that a third high rise building in New York collapsed in free fall that day. The World Trade Center of Seven allegedly fell due to an office fire. Ever heard of an office fire <laughs> pulling it down? I mean, he's, he put it, put it a little different. I mean, come on. I mean, why did the third building come down? And then the same fashion as the two uh, trade centers. Good question. The BBC reported that Building 7 had collapsed before it had collapsed. That means the BBC knew beforehand that the building was going to collapse even though no plane had hit it. How is it possible that these three towers were pulverized into rubble and ash, but the passports of the alleged terrorists were found intact? Those who believe the official story probably also believe that COVID, the COVID vaccine is safe <laughs> and effective. The earth is flat and that Mark Zuckerberg is a lizard person. And the main question still remains, who did it? That's it. Peace out. Stay free. Got another lizard just sitting here. Hope the little guy ain't dead. I've never seen him sit like this for such a long time. See how close we can get to him. He don't look good to me. 
anyway, there's the there's the dog in all his glory. <laughs> I forgot uh, we're gonna tack on a video. Uh, this is Melania Trump. She's talking about the fact that everybody seems to have forgotten about the uh, the shooting of Donald. Let's watch that 30 second video. The attempt to end my husband's life was a horrible, distressing experience. Now. The silence around it feels heavy. I can't help but wonder, why didn't law enforcement officials arrest the shooter before the speech? There is definitely more to this story, and we need to uncover the truth. I wanted to get just a nature clip here and tell you something else you can do to help your community. I want you to support your local farmers, whether that's buying meat, eggs, or produce in any way that you can. Uh, right here in my area, we have a flea market that meets on every weekend, and uh, the farmers all show up with their fresh produce, and that's where I buy all my produce. Please, support your local community. Do what you can. Don't buy everything at Walmart.